So I'm uh, sitting here editing my YouTube video after I recorded it, uh, almost 12-ish hours after I actually recorded it, and I realized that a little bit of my intro got cut off, and it's the part where I go like, and we're back. And I kind of like that intro a lot. It makes me feel like I'm, I'm like, cool with you guys. You know, it makes me feel like I'm cool, actually, just in general. Um, and so I think I want to keep it. Um, but uh, I, I also tried just taking a few, like, recordings of myself saying, and we're back, and then seeing if I could just lead into it. But um, I'm too tired right now. It's like, you can see it's 9, like, 50 in the morning. Um, and so what's going to happen is I'm going to do one take. Uh right now and we're gonna pretend uh you and i are both gonna pretend like i did a very good job and i'm gonna i'm gonna lead into um what i what i actually recorded almost 12 hours ago and we're gonna pretend like it was a perfect transition and i and i like maintained my tone the entire time and we're both gonna be happy about that okay so uh i'm gonna record something right now we're going three two one and we're back this time after a month or something and this time we're going to be doing all right that's what it sounded like didn't i do a good job all right thank you thank you thank you and uh, now here's the rest of the video or at least i'm going to be doing i'm going to be covering uh, another part of darkest dungeon today we're going to cover the quirks of darkest dungeon i'm going to try and uh one take this so i don't have to edit as hard um, and this one will be a little easier because I've actually made notes for myself here. And this is a spreadsheet I made in uh, Google Docs, which I will be including a link to in the description um, so that you can go take a look at it. Currently, um, I've got a lot of tiers. We've got S, A, B, C, D, E, and soon I'll put an F tier. Um, I don't have descriptions for every single quirk yet just because I'm a little lazy with the lower tier quirks that I really don't know what to write for just because they're kind of useless. But um, other than that, today we're just going to go over the S tier and the A tier quirks. So in this video, specifically, you're going to be getting all the best quirks um, only. And that's probably, this is probably the most important video, um, just so you know what you should be looking out for and what you should be locking. Um, just a quick disclaimer uh, before I actually continue. Uh, this list, uh, you're going to read it up here. Uh, this list is made with the assumption that quirks are more flexible and generally weaker individually than trinkets. Um, there are five quirk slots. You know, there's five positive quirk slots for you to work with. And each quirk is just like a really simple line of text. You can see, like, I put I put descriptions here. Very simple line of text um, compared to the two trinket slots. And trinkets generally have, like, three or four lines of text, which means they're a lot more complex and do a lot more things. Um, so, in conclusion, therefore, to me at least... Uh, quirks are excuses for me to not to have to run certain trinkets. Um, any quirk that does the same thing as a trinket or does a lot of things that a trinket does is going to be rated pretty highly, and you'll see that as we go through uh, the list. Um, but uh, let's talk about tiers real quick. Oh, yeah, we also have a legend here, but whatever. Uh, let's talk about tiers real quick. The S tier. So th these are the best quirks in the game. Um, these are all universally lockable. I would say anyone who develops any of these quirks um, generally has a very good reason for you to lock them in. Um, either that or the few people, there are a few people in the game where if they develop one of these quirks, it is considered, I would consider it overpowered just completely. And you should definitely lock it. Um, you'll actually notice as well, uh, if, if you just do a quick scrolling through the list, there's prismatic quirks and corvid quirks. So, um, those are, those are quirks that you get from the Thing and the Shrieker, respectively. Uh, those are automatically locked. So you don't actually have to lock those quirks. They just automatically come unreplaceable, um, on your characters. Uh, they are unique to that character only, though. Um, but they, they do come with huge numbers for what they do. And, uh, let's start with Prismatic Calm, then, which I believe is the best quirk in the game. Uh, this quirk is... Very, very defensive. Uh, minus 30% stress is a huge stress reduction. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through my reasoning as well. It saves a lot of stress. It's a huge defensive quirk, yeah. Uh, most of the people who suffer from heavy stress trinkets and, pe and least, stre least useful on people who stress heal themselves. Um, so yeah, a lot of the times in the game you'll be being hit by like, what, like 8s or 9s in terms of stress. Maybe like some 12s. And 30% of 8s and 9s and 12s is, is huge. It's like 4 stress being saved. You're saving a lot of stress. Uh, 3 to 4 stress, actually. It's a lot of stress. That's that, that saves you a lot of stress healing. And almost anyone with Prismatic Calm is uh, generally guaranteed to never be afflicted. Um, 
And if they are afflicted, it's only because uh, of the AI's targeting pattern where they, they, want, they like to focus down the person who's most stressed, which means you're generating um, a lot of value in that scenario where, where you became stressed uh, on the character with Prismatic Calm, you generated a lot of value because they, they probably got stress focused and you saved a lot of stress. Um, but in the scenario where you didn't get afflicted, this character was, was pretty safe and probably leaded the least stress uh, management so uh, the best characters for this, uh, you can see here I listed those as well, but I'm going to go through the reasoning. Flagellant, PD, Occultist, Shieldbreaker. So Plague Doctor and Occultist specifically have very, very amazing trinkets that cost them both 25% stress. That would be the Blasphemous Vial for Plague Doctor and the Demon's Cauldron for Occultist. They are very, very powerful in what they do, giving Plague Doctor and Occultist amazing stun percentages and uh, other things on top of that as well. Um, so they really, really like Prismatic Calm to kind of mitigate that stress penalty that they get. Um, it brings them back to roughly neutral, and that's very amazing with the amazing, amazing trinkets that uh, effects that they're um, utilizing. Uh, Flagellant as well I have here as pretty high up, just because Flagellant, uh, in the mid and late game, uh, his Endure skill, the one that transfers stress from one character to the Flagellant, um, it actually gives a, a good ratio of um, stress saved in that case. Uh, I think in the late game, specifically at max level, you heal 14 stress and put six stress on the flagellant. So the flagellant himself, like, ca like stress casts himself repeatedly. So with Prismatic Calm, instead of taking six stress, you take four stress, roughly. And that's amazing. So you, you can really get like a really strong ratio out of the flagellant. He starts to heal for 10, for 10 stress overall, you know, deal, heal 14, take Four instead and that that heals on the level of a jester already uh jester heals for like i think 12 or something like that and so this makes flagellant who's already a pretty decent stress healer into an even better stress healer and that's amazing i, I really like that for the flagellant uh shield breaker i have here just because shield breaker uh it, her nightmares that you get uh, subjected to uh, on camping uh it is they're they they are really heavy stress uh stress mo uh, inducing scenarios for the shield breaker because she takes a 20 by something horror 20 by like six uh so 20 over six turns and minus 30 percent stress for shield breaker is insane in those fights it makes it really not punishing for her uh to be in those fights and you have to be in those fights sometimes you like you're forced to be in those fights so uh it generates a lot of value for the shield breaker specifically um uh, I have a worst characters column. Uh, this is not really a column that is meant to dis describe who this quirk is bad on. It's specifically the worst. So these are the characters that make the least use of this quirk. These characters still uh, really like this quirk. This quirk is very, very powerful. So these characters don't mind having that quirk uh, either. But they are, they're definitely the, the, the ones that make the least use of it. That would be Leper, Abomination, Jester, Crusader, Houndmaster. And what's shared between all these characters is that they have a way to deal with stress. They have either a stress heal in the in the Jester, Crusader, Houndmaster, or they have a self-stress heal in the Leper and the Abomination. So they, they don't mind being stressed as much. Uh, they still prefer to stay away from that, that 100, 100 stress um, affliction uh, uh, scenario, but it's they can handle themselves. Uh, so that's Prismatic Calm. Let's move on to Prismatic Coagulation and Prismatic Purity. I'm going to do these both together because they essentially do the same thing. Prismatic Coagulation and Purity are plus 25 to your Bleed and Blight Resist. These are your dots in the game that damage over time. And uh, the dots are a huge, huge part of what makes the final dungeons, the Darkest Dungeons 1 through 4, uh, as hard as they are. Um, dots are very, very powerful in damaging the player because as a player when you get a dot applied to you you can't heal any of that dot damage unless you wait out a few turns so in order to like get the get get yourself healed back up to a uh, full when you get hit with a dot you have to wait two or three turns in order for the dot to damage you then you heal it back right so dots themselves are a way for the game to to like kind of challenge you do you want to stay for even longer in this fight just to make sure you're topped off at 100% HP? Or do you want to just leave now and not take extra damage from the opponent? So it's up to you to decide, and generally, uh, generally you, you stay, but like when you don't, when you need to get out of the fight like right now, you're going to be going to the next fight in a, in a slightly handicapped manner, and that's not very ideal. 
Um, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of other reasons why dots are very bad. Another one of the reasons is um, that one of the easiest way to lose characters in the game is when they get knocked down to death's door and w with a crit, maybe an unexpected crit, or just knock down a death's door in general and get a dot applied to them. And then, you know, obviously when they outspeed your healer next turn or like this turn, the dot ticks and then you, you do a death door roll. Um, and you never want to be doing death door rolls in this game because in, in like, sure, like 33% of the time you, you die and 67% of the time you, you know, you live. But in an, if you live in another scenario, in another universe, that character died. And so you never want to be trying to roll the dice. And of course, 25% 25, 25 for both of these dots is insane. It's just really, really good. Um, uh, notable ones that I, th oh, and I believe co coagulation is a lot better. Then, uh, well, not a lot better, but it's better than purity specifically because you, there's actually a there's a hero in the game that tries to bleed your other heroes, the occultist, right? So it's very it's very um it's notable that coagulation has synergy with what you're trying to do. Sometimes the occultist wants to, you know the you know, the word reconstruction sometimes he uh it heals you but also bleeds you. Um, so coagulation is very good at resisting that occultist uh, attempt to bleed. And uh, most of the enemies in the game, uh, one of the more common enemies you'll be facing throughout your entire playthrough is actually the cultist brawler. Uh, let's actually look him up. Since since you're looking at my, since I'm just screen sharing, we can actually do things like um, cultist brawler. Whoops, cultist brawler. Um, if we look at this enemy, he actually, if, he's a generic um, enemy you see across all dungeons. So you see, you see his first move here has a, it's it's a bleed move, and this is the move he su he spams the mo uh, actually it's the only move he spams unless you push him into positions three and four. Uh, he, so this move he always uses and it always attempts to bleed you. So um, one of the most common enemies in the game will attempt to bleed you, and so I think prismatic coagulation is um, better it has more use cases than prismatic purity, and they're both very amazing still. Um, let's see, what did I say here? Basically, I covered everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, DD1 and DD4 are bleed-oriented, and DD2 and DD3 are blight-oriented, so if you want to think about that. Um, oh yeah, Flagellant bleeds himself, uh, with Reclaim. You'd like to have, uh, him have Prismatic Coagulation so he doesn't bleed himself. Frontliners tend to get hit by the Cultist Brawler, who can only target positions 1 and 2, so I say Frontliners are pretty good for that, for this quirk as well. Um, for Prismatic Purity, PD and Abomination I have as best characters, just because um, when I'm trinketing for the Darkest Dungeons specifically, I I trinket slightly defensively uh, for the the dot resist, because a lot of the damage that comes from those Darkest Dungeons, from the Darkest Dungeon fights, will be dots, um, because you sometimes get like applied 6x3 dots in those, in those dungeons, and uh, so people like the Plague Doctor and the Abomination who have the highest blight resist in the game, uh, they just they just need a little bit more to to conf to like really resist um, the dots in the darkest dungeons. So the dots in the darkest dungeons are all at 150 percent. Um, and PD and Abomination specifically have like I think 120. We can actually look it up. Yeah, it's called damage calculator. I don't know why, but I'm gonna pull up my spreadsheet for the the, the, the characters. And yeah, they we, they've got 120. Um, uh, these characters, these two characters specifically, if they, if they get prismatic purity, they are immune completely to those, to those specific uh, enemies in Darkest Dungeons 2 and 3. Very, very good. Very, very powerful. They don't have to trinket at all for dot resist, and they can just trinket focusing solely on, um, dealing with the enemy and augmenting their abilities rather than defensive, r augmenting their offensive capabilities or proactive abilities rather than try to uh, trinket defensively in dots. Uh, yeah, but uh, other than that, honestly, anybody would love it. Anybody here would really, really love this this defensive quirk. Really, really amazing. Yeah. So moving on from those two. Oh, yeah, so these three are defensive quirks. Uh, these three are probably the only defensive quirks you'll see me rate this high. Uh, generally, the better quirks in the game are very uh, proactive and aggressively oriented just because the game is generally pretty fast. And you don't really, there's not really enough, like, reason to run, like, super defensive things outside of uh, the Darkest Dungeons, because you know exactly what's going to be hitting you in the Darkest Dungeons. Um, so, besides that, we've got very, very aggressive quirks in the upper tier. Uh, the next set being Elder Slayer and Beast Slayer. Uh, so, these are the, um, like, these are the quirks that give you plus 10 accuracy and plus 5 crit versus a specific type. And for Eldritch Slayer, obviously, that's Eldritch, and for Beast Slayer, that's Beast. 
And uh, we're, I'm just going to read straight off of this um, for now. Um, a lot of content in the game is Eldritch or Beast. Like, a lot of it. Cove has, like, those those fish are all Eldritch. The Weald has a bunch of Eldritch stuff in the Scratcher and the Artillery. Um, the Weald, uh, the Warrens has a bunch of Beasts. Uh, that would be the, all, like, all the pigs. All the pigs are beasts, straight up. Yeah, and in the, in the, in the Darkest Dungeon specifically, uh, you've got a lot of both Eldritch and Beast. Uh, they're all over. Some of the hardest enemies in those dungeons are Eldritch. Uh, almost all of the hardest enemies in that, oh, actually, all, all, I could say this with confidence, all of the hardest enemies in the Darkest Dungeons are Eldritch, and a lot of them have a secondary type that is Beast. Um, so you these quirks specifically will generate a huge amount of value in not only regular dungeons but also um, also the darkest dungeons. And let's let's really quick just think about like ten accuracy and five crit is literally the exact same as one of the strongest very rare trinkets in the entire game, focus ring. Focus ring also comes with a negative eight uh, dodge uh, downside. So this, these quirks specifically can be valued in the hardest scenarios in the game. They can be valued as a full, very rare trinket on your character. And that is insane. That is so much power on one quirk alone. This, and accuracy is such a strong thing to be trinketing for. Just because you want to hit consistently. And you are missing a lot of accuracy versus some of the darkest dungeon um, enemies. Um, and crit is also very good. It, it gives so much power. Crit is just a very strong stat to me, just because it gives you offensive capabilities as well as stress healing, and that's very, very impactful. Um, so you can see this is a very aggressive-oriented quirk, so obviously the best characters uh, will be damage dealers for these quirks. Uh, but regardless, I still think it's universally lockable. You can lock these on a utility character, and that'll be just fine. 10 accuracy works for a lot of people. The accuracy is just good. Bounty Hunter likes to use that, likes to hit his stuns. PD likes to hit her stuns. Hellion likes to hit her stuns. A lot of people like just, just to hit things. And 5 crit is very, very impactful as well, just because like things like Man at Arms' Rampart, even though it doesn't have a very high damage for that crit to be impactful on, it has a stun chance, where if you crit, obviously, um, you get plus 20% stun application chance so this is just very very good quirks i'm not going to spend too much more time on it i've already oozed all over it um but like i said before accuracy is very very one of the more important things to quirk for in the game that's why you can see the you know this accuracy quirk being very very high and so i believe the next set of best quirks is uh corvette's eye and prismatic eye which is eight accuracy um and for corvette's eye it's eight scouting chance um like I said, everyone needs accuracy, and 8 is huge, especially when you compare it to Focus Ring, which gives you 10. So this, these quirks alone are very, very powerful. They give you almost a rare trinket's worth, uh, a very rare trinket's worth of value um, alone. And in the case of Corvus Eye, 8% scouting chance is insane against um, regular dungeons, where scouting chance is very, very important. In the Darkest Dungeons, though, um, it doesn't really matter. Scout, you can't actually can't scout in the Darkest Dungeon with Scouting Chance specifically. So in the Darkest Dungeons, uh, Corvid's Eye and Prismatic Eye are worth the exact same. And outside of that, they are just both very, very good quirks. Eight Accuracy is very, very good. Very often you'll be putting Accuracy Trinkets on your Damage Dealers and um, just to make sure they hit, and your Stunners just to make sure they hit, same thing. Um, just good stuff. Uh, everyone likes this, no one hates it. Everyone needs some Accuracy, just a little bit helps. Um, Although, if I ha I guess if I had to pick one person who didn't need accuracy, which I'll put here, probably the Arbalist. Arbalist has 115 base accuracy, one of the, like, literally the strongest in the game. She'll probably need it the least, need it the least but still lockable. Uh, I mean, these are, I mean, these come locked, but it's lockable. I, if they didn't come locked, I would say they're lockable. So, um, after that, the next set is the other version of the uh, type quirks, which is Eldritch Hater and Beast Hater. And these quirks are are signif uh, well these these quirks are weaker than the Elder Slayer and Beast Slayer, um, just because of what they do. Obviously, fifteen damage, fifteen percent damage, and minus fifteen str stress versus Eldritch and Beast respectively. Um, still very strong quirks, but these quirks are weaker just because um th what trinkets can do. Um, trinkets they they tr the best the best accuracy trinkets in the game give you ten accuracy. But the best damage trinkets in the game give you 25 damage, right? So, um, in terms of Eldritch and Beast Slayer, they give you the best that the game can offer. Um, but Eldritch Hater and Beast Hater, they don't give you the best that the game can offer. And so, I value Eldritch Slayer and Hater as 
better than the hater quirks. Just, uh, but also because accuracy is just more important than damage. It's very good to be able to hit things. So, be, because a lot of the game is about being able to predict what you, um, what you what you can uh, being able to predict what you can do, what your characters can manage, can really set up for powerful turns so that you can plan around uh, whether or not something will be stunned or not uh, next turn before they go or something like that. Um, but yeah, also minus percent stress, although I did say is very powerful with Prismatic Calm um, at 30%, it is not as strong when you put it to lower numbers like 15, um, just because you're not really reaching much bank benchmarks with 15% where you're reducing a lot of stress. And uh, not only that, these are the stress portion is only against these specific enemies, and the specific enemies that are Beast and Eldritch that will stress cast you are very few. Uh, I can't really even think of an Eldritch one off the top of my head that does stress cast you at all. Uh, but Beast ones are only the swine, uh, the swine Wretch, so that's a little, little, little pig, and the Swine Drummer, so that's the drummer in the Warrens. Um, so there's just the amount, of, the amount of places where this minus stress um, will activate and the amount of enemies it'll activate against in those places is just not high enough for me to really like um, this minus stress portion. Um, but it's still, it's still good. It's still good because in the hardest content in the darkest dungeons, it's always active and that's very, very powerful. It's 15 damage is also very good. Universally lockable on all characters as well. But I would say the best people for this is actually the Vestal Man at Arms Jester Occultus. And these are all your, your better utility characters in the game. And a lot of these guys actually do have a very strong damaging move, so they'll make good use of the damage uh, percent. So that would be just really quick rattling from left to right. Judgment, Crush, Slice Off, Sacrificial Stab. Uh, and the minus 15% stress I value on these guys very highly just because these guys are utility. They keep you alive, they keep you going, they keep you just your your team good, right? They keep your team good. Uh, and being stressed and being afflicted, causing them to skip turns is very, very bad. Um, so, yeah, very strong. Oh, actually, wait, I, for some reason I didn't include Houndmaster here. Houndmaster should be here for sure, yeah. And you'll see there's actually, in the next the next few quirks, these four, uh, they all have a similar theme to them. They have plus speed. Speed is very, very good in this game. It is so powerful to be fast. Going before people, going before enemies is very good. Um, and the reason for that is you get to kill them before they, they even act. You get to stun them before they even act. You get to buff your allies before your allies act. And if your allies are fast after you buff them, they get to make use of those buffs and attack the enemies to kill them before they move. A lot of good stuff with more speed. Healers, guarders, damage dealers, stunners. All, like, everybody in the game needs more speed. Because going before your enemies, being very proactive is very strong. If you look at this, you'll just, you'll be able to tell why uh, they are listed in this order. Just more speed is better, and more speed with more stuff is better. And, uh, and speed that just comes without a condition is very good. Um, but these are all very powerful. Uh, you'll be playing at high torch almost the entire time. So this could just read plus two speed. Um, and anyone at all, uh, the best characters to put it on are any at, anyone at all who has middling or below average speed. So that would be um, just anyone with seven or eight speed and below. Uh, so the specific people who are fast, um, I can pull it up here just to verify with you. Uh, the specific people who are fast are these guys. These guys, I would say, need it the least, just because speed on these guys can have them accidentally outspeed your healer when they are on death's door with a dot and kill them. Um, they need it the least, but I would still say it's amazing to have speed on them. Um, but why did I list specifically these three, the Grave Robber, Shieldbreaker, and Jester? I listed these three because they... Um, uh, let's look at the others, right? So, Abomination, Plague Doctor... And Flagellant are all stunners slash healers. They all need to go fast. Stunners that are fast are very good. Healers that go fast can heal people off death's door. Stuff like that, right? So they, they still need to go fast. And there's a benefit. There's an active benefit for them going fast. Um, even faster, like to guarantee it more for them. There's a really good benefit for that. Grave Robber is just a damage dealer. And uh, Jester is already faster than everyone else. So when he buffs, uh, it's, it's probably going to be consistently fast anyway. Uh, he's also a damage dealer. Um, and Shieldbreaker is just a straight damage dealer. So these three people, are they share a similar theme. They're damage dealers. Um, and damage dealers that are already decently fast don't need to go too much faster. They also have to be very frail damage dealers. Grave Robber being one of the frailest in the game. Jester being very close behind. Uh, Shieldbreaker actually being probably the frailest in the game. Uh, these guys would just like to not be that fast. Um, 
being frail and being fast is a very dangerous combination in this game. Um, so yeah, that's that section over here. Uh, so the next one is Photomania. This is a minus 20% stress uh, quirk. So this is very comparable to Prismatic Calm, which is is 10% less uh, when you're, well, of course, when you're at high torch. So that's 75 and up. Um, the torch requirement, though, is nothing just because you'll probably be playing on high torch all the time anyway, just to make the game as easy as possible. Um, it, low torch, I, okay, so I already explained why minus stress is very good, and I explained why it's not as good, maybe when it's 15, it's still good. It, like, minus stress is just good, and minus 20 is good, still. Um, and this is a very strong quirk. Um, I'm not gonna ex re-explain to you why stress, minus stress is very good. I'm gonna explain to you why, why should we, why should we always play on high torch? Um, you shouldn't always play on high torch. You should play on low torch only when you feel it's necessary. And what low torch does is it gives you more loot, right? So when you feel like you need more loot, you should play on low torch, right? Because uh, it's an option the game gives you to get around a problem you're having. But when when do I personally feel I need more loot? I feel like I never need more loot. Um, when I'm running a medium or long dungeon, I feel that I'm able to pick up more loot than I need, uh, necessarily, uh, and it, and by that I mean it fills my inventory and more, um, and I'm I have to start throwing away things to make space for more loot or like loot that I think is more valuable. So I don't really think there's ever a requirement or a need to be on low torch. It just makes your it just makes it just puts yourself in a more dangerous uh, scenario for no, almost no reason. And so I think photomania should be read as minus twenty stress, and that's very good. Right. Um. Obviously, the the best and worst characters is the exact same as above uh, for Prismatic Calm. And this next quirk is Hippocratic. Hippocratic is a simple plus 20% heal given out. Um, and this quirk is actually absolutely useless on two-thirds of the heroes in the game. Um, so why is it up here? It's up here not for being universally lockable, but for being nichely OP. This quirk alone is so outrageously powerful on the characters that heal. So that would be the Vestal, Occultist, Crusader, Arbalist, PD, Antiquarian. I listed them all here. Um, it gives them so much healing individually that some of these guys who are um, just a little bit off from being a good primary healer, like the Arbalist or the Crusader, they are going to become healers now. Um, they're just going to become r really respectable healers. Um, and it gives the PD and Antiquarian, who are slightly subpar in directly healing your HP, more healing, and that's very good because it makes them more efficient, and they that might free up a trinket slot when when you're considering uh, maybe giving Antiquarian or Plague Doctor a healing trinket. It might it might free up that trinket slot, or it might give them more action economy, and those are two very very powerful things. Um, of course, the Vestal you almost always staple on a healing trinket on her, and but having Hippocratic can let you not put that healing trinket on a Vestal, and that's very very powerful. Of course, you can still put the healing trinket on the Vestal, and that Vestal will be healing for crazy crazy amounts, but it it reduces your need, your absolute must to put that healing trinket on a Vestal or an Occultist as well. Occultist generally likes to run Chirurgeon's Charm um, next to a Cauldron, or maybe a Junius Head next to something else that's not a Cauldron um, that doesn't give as much stress. But you can kind of skip it if you have a Hippocratic Occultist. And I actually think that's one of the strongest things in the game, a, Hippoc a Hippocratic Occultist. Um, let me let me just quickly sum up the reason why this quirk is here. Do you like dying? I don't like dying. Not dying is very good. Hippocratic is very good, right? Very simple there. Um, so who are the best people for it? Just the ones I listed, Vestal, Occultist, Crusader, Arbalist. I didn't really specifically list PD and Anti just because it does very little for them, but it's it's, it's good for them still. Um, everyone else doesn't really make use of this quirk. It's not really that impressive. Uh, there is another set of people who actually make use of this quirk, and that's the self-healers. So that would be Hellion with Adrenaline, Leper with um, Solemnity, Abomination with uh, Absolution, and Houndmaster with Lick Wounds. So those four people still make use of this quirk. But I just think it's so weak for them, just because they can't heal anyone else except for themselves. And so it's just not applicable for them as much as it is for um, the main four that I listed here. Uh, okay, so the, these are really interesting. These two over here are actually negative quirks, which is why I have them red, just to draw attention to the fact that they're negative. Uh, these are both negative quirks, which I believe actually make your characters better a lot of the time. Um, and 
So let's go over what they do, right? Risk Taker, plus 10% damage and minus 10 dodge. So the, the negative part of this quirk is minus 10 dodge. How impactful is minus 10 dodge? I don't actually think it's that bad. It's not too rough. You're, a lot, dodge is too low in this game for you to reliably re, like expect to dodge. Um, unless you really actively play into the dodge mindset and comp with maybe double antiquarian or like double, double dodge trinket and like maybe dodge buffs happening left and right bolsters and like shards and bolsters again. Stuff like that is, is how you get dodge to be very reliable. And that's a lot of investment for something that's pretty powerful, but it takes a long time to set up. And so dodge comps to me just don't work a lot of the time. Um, and so 10 dodge is not that bad. Minus 10 dodge is not that bad. A lot of the best trinkets in the game give you minus dodge as well. Focus ring gives you minus 8 dodge. Stuff like that. Um, and 10 damage is pretty strong. 10% damage, although it's not a very, as big a number as Eldritch and Beast Hater over here with 15, it's still really respectable because this quirk always applies. It doesn't only apply versus Eldritch or it doesn't only apply versus Beast. It's, it applies versus everything. And that's pretty good. Like, this this is a good trade-off. I like damage, and I don't mind losing dodge for it. Um, and I have the both... Oh, by the way, I have both of these in the S tier just because they don't take up one of your five uh, positive quirk slots. They, they take up a negative quirk slot, which means these, are, these quirks are benefiting your characters without actually costing you a quirk slot. And that's very, very strong because that's the uh, that's opportunity cost you're making up for. And, um, right. Uh, oh yeah, best characters are damage dealers, and the worst characters to have this on are frail characters. Um, so that would be your jester, shield breaker, your grave robber, uh, uh, maybe like a cultist. Just frail characters just don't want to lose dodge. They're already trying to to live off of dodge. Jester and uh, grave robber specifically are really high dodge characters that really try and abuse the dodge uh, mechanic to try and survive. Um, they do a really poor job at it, so don't decrease their chances of survival even further. Uh, 10 damage is okay, but it's not too important. Uh, the other quirk is Winded, which is when you are below 50% uh, HP, minus 1 speed. And why is this a good quirk? Minus speed is, seems pretty bad, right? Um, e especially since I put all the speed quirks up here. Why is this a bad quirk? It's because yeah. you only get minus speed when you're at low HP. And that's very, that's very good, because when you're at low HP, there's a chance you might be actually on Death's Door. And being on death's door and losing speed is very, very powerful because that means your healers might go before you and heal you off of death's door so you don't have to do a death's blower roll when you have a dot on you. And now I just set up like a really, really like super niche scenario maybe, but in, in my mind, that's the only way you lose characters. And so Winded is a very good way for you to avoid what I believe is the only way to lose characters in this game. Um, uh, is the only un unavoidable way to lose characters in this game is, is, is a crit to death's door and a dot applied. So I like Winded a lot. I think it's pretty strong. And I think everyone w would like Winded. Okay, now that we're finished with the S tier quirks, let's move on to the A tier quirks. These I have described to be... Wait, what the? Why is this parentheses here? Uh, yes, but anyway, these quirks I've described to be um, still very strong and very, very lockable. Uh, but they might be more niche uh, than the ones above, or maybe they are directly outclassed by some of the ones above, as we'll see with Clotter and Thick-Blooded, which are directly outclassed by the Prismatic Quirks uh, versions of them. Uh, the Prismatic giving 25, and they give 15 and 10 respectively. Uh, yes, this is not a typo. Thick-Blooded actually only gives you 10 Blight Resist, while Clotter gives you 15. Um, so that's why that's one main reason why I believe Clotter is better than Thick-Blooded. The other reason is I just believe Bleed Resist is more important than Blight Resist, generally. Um... But uh, you can you can uh, go back to when I was describing why these are powerful, and it's the same reason why these are powerful. Uh, these can go on more people, though, because they're not limited to one character only. So these are really nice. Uh, and you'll see that this section of the uh, tier list is going to be uh, the first turn quirks. Um, the first turn quirks are super powerful in my mind, um, and it's a very simple. It's a very there's a very simple reason why. Um, when you queue, when you queue into a fight, when you when you get it, when you queue into an encounter, you will always have a first turn. That first turn, you will always be forced to play, right? You might not be forced to play the second turn or maybe the third turn, um, because you've probably you might have ended the fight by then, right? So, what what that means is you want to make sure that your first turn is very very strong, um, more than you care about the second or third turn. And it's not like these quirks are actually like reducing your ability to do well in the second and third turn. They're just imp they're just augmenting your first turn, and that's very very strong. 
Um, especially something with hot, like hot to trot, just gives you like crazy amounts of damage. Twenty five percent damage. That's insane. That's literally matching the best trinket in the game for damage, which is Dismiss's head. Um, and it gives you twenty accuracy. This gives you twice as much accuracy as a focus ring. Whatever move you're using on the first turn is going to connect. Twenty percent. Twenty accuracy is so much accuracy, and it gives you five crit on top of that. So your move, it, it on top of being also just more explosive, um, it also double dips into that with more crit. So like, you can get even more explosive. Um, and so Hot to Trot, I believe, for being able to really pump up your damage numbers is better than the other two, which only pump up your speed. And I say only pump up your speed, but speed is so good in the first turn. Just the same reason why these quirks are here. These quirks are very strong. The same, it's the same thing why these are strong. Uh, these are only in A tier just because um, for the boss fights in the later game, or just for boss fights in general, you're not only going to have a first turn. You're going to have a first, second, third, fourth, maybe up to eight turns um, on certain bosses. And so these these obviously will all fall off. All three of these will fall off uh, like in the boss fights. But a lot of boss fights, um, like for example in the Darkest Dungeon 2, you like to get up a fast guard um, just to make sure you're not taking that revelation hit um, on your non-torched character. And so things like this are very strong. Uh, especially for uh, Man at Arms and How Masters specifically, who really want to get off their fast guard. I like, I especially like these quirks, these speed quirks on a Man at Arms, just because he has so many things he wants to do on turn one. He likes to set up a guard. He likes to set up a bolster for the harder fights. Um, I know people like to run Retribution sometimes. It's probably one of my least favorite moves on the Man at Arms specifically. But getting up a fast Retribution is very good because fast reposts are very strong. Um, they the, the faster you can set up the repost, the more chances your enemies have to attack into your repost and get counterattacked. And for that same reason, for that same vein of reasoning, um, Hi Highwayman actually is a very good uh, user of these two quirks specifically. And the other people are Hellion, who is just a below below average speed damage dealer, uh, one of the best in the game, who will just really be powerful, amazing. Uh, just no complaints at all with Hellion if she could just be faster. Um, so quick draw and on guard for Hellion specifically is amazing. Plague Doctor is here just because uh, fast stunner for the back line is very good. A lot of people just really like this quirk. Uh, I'm already, I'm already, uh, as I read this, I'm already feeling bad that I didn't include think people like Bounty Hunter, Vestal, like other uh, back, uh, other stunners are like Abomination. Everyone just loves these quirks, to be honest. Um, yeah, damage dealers too, like someone like the Crusader, Grave Robber, although I listed her as one of the worst, still loves this. These quirks are just good for everyone, to be honest. Um, yeah, but I listed these guys here, Grave Robber and Shieldbreaker, just because they're fast damage dealers that don't really need it, uh, for the same reason that they don't need the, um, the, the speed quirks from above. Uh, so let's move on, though. Five accuracy, just good. Uh, natural swing's just good. I think it's the same reason as eight accuracy up here being good. Five accuracy is good. Uh, it's probably not as good, I think. It's not as, uh, S tier, just because it's just not a lot. It's not a very big number. But, hey, more accuracy is good. I like more accuracy. And the uh, the next set of quirks is crit. Uh, the crit quirks. I like crit a lot. Um, I am a gambler a little bit with uh, damage dealing. I like crit a lot, uh, even though it's unreliable a lot of the time uh, compared to damage. You'll see that damage I have directly under crit. Uh, I like crit just because it gives me like a really, really explosive number, and it always guarantees that I do a lot of damage. Because how crit works in this game is they take your highest damage roll, and multiply by 1.5 times, and that's your damage when you crit. And so I, I'm a big fan of that explosive number, and on top of that explosive number, I'm also getting a stress heal from crit. And so I, I view crit as not only a, a an aggressive stat, but also a very defensive stat, because it, heal, it stress heals you along the way. So I really like these crit quirks. Um, I have Precise Striker up here, uh, even though it only gives 5 crit to melee moves, just because I think some of the best damage dealers in the game are melee-oriented. So we've got, like... Um, We've got, uh, wait, yeah, we've got Hellion, Shieldbreaker, High Man, Man at Arms, Bounty Hunter. All these guys are just spamming their really strong melee moves and really just making a lot of use of uh, Precise Striker. And they, they, they really, really, really make so much out of this quirk. And and so uh, and oh, all, almost all the heroes that don't uh, that don't do a lot of damage or don't need to crit specifically are range damage dealers, which are like. Uh, which have generally a lower base damage, um, and that's why they don't need. Uh, that I consider them not good damage dealers. Uh, the, your best range damage dealer probably Arbalist, maybe Houndmaster, 
Um, and those guys are, are just like on some of the like more average numbers in terms of damage dealing compared to these melee guys. Just this reads this essentially just reads five crit to me. But of course, you can't guarantee you get it on uh, these these characters with melee uh, skills. So obviously, it's completely it's actually F tier if you want to say on the Arbalist. Obviously, this quirk is worth nothing at all in Arbalist. But um, I'm just gonna choose to describe to you the best scenario and tell you you know remove it on the Arbalist. Uh, in in contrast, prismatic precision is four crit uh, for everybody, and I again I don't really value crit as much on the range damage dealers as I do on the melee ones. So really, this reads to me four crit um, compared to this, which reads five crit, and so that's why I think this is just slightly worse than uh, precise striker. Uh, but of course, everyone can use it, and non damage dealers probably don't need it. But I mean, uh, let me let me go back. Let me revisit this point. Uh, if you crit moves that apply dots or apply stuns, they, they get 20% extra chance. So it's still good, even on these guys. But they need it least. Uh, then we've got the next section of this, which is these three, Prismatic Force, Warrior of Light, and Slugger, which are all just uh, damage quirks. And damage quirks are very good um, still. They probably, uh, they're only in A tier, just because th the numbers are just too low compared to what you can trinket for. Um, but because they can substitute trinkets sometimes, uh, they're pretty strong. Um, because you can you can get away with these and, and probably decide not to trinket for um, damage as much and probably just trinket for accuracy, trinket for speed, and have one of these quirks as your, you know, quote-unquote damage trinket. And that's why they're so far up here, just because I think they do replace trinkets. And uh, more damage is always good. It, it really gets you to a lot of um, the, the break points you need to get to in this game. Um, uh, do I really say anything important here in this giant wall of notes? Uh, no, not really. If you want to scroll through this and read it, that's fine. Um, but, yeah, everyone kind of needs it. And uh, non-damage dealers obviously need it the least. Uh, obviously, for Slugger, actually, let me change this. Oh, yeah, so weak slash no melee options. Um, yeah, so, like, someone like Houndmaster probably doesn't need it, even though he has a, a strong uh, stun move that is melee in Blackjack. He just doesn't need it. You're probably not logging in Slugger on a Houndmaster. It's still, it still, it does something, but it just doesn't do a lot. Um... Right, uh, let's move on to the next set, uh, which is Prismatic Solidity and Hard Noggin, which are both Stun Resist quirks. Um, stun Resist is very, very high, despite not being a Dot Resist, just because I think stun stuns are some of the most um, annoying things to have to deal with in this game as a player. Uh, it really causes a lot of problems when your healer is stunned uh, when they really need to heal, and those are problems you really don't want to be in. Uh, those are situations you don't want to be in. Uh, it also is really good to have hard noggin and solidity on people like um, garters and reposters uh, because those are the guys that um, those are the characters that um, will benefit the most from not being stunned. Uh, garters they they drop their guard when they're stunned and that's really bad because that could expose someone who's on low HP um, or in DD two specifically it can expose someone who is not holding a torch to that revelation, which can deal half their HP and hit them with like 40 stress or something crazy like that. Um, you don't want that to ever happen. So especially when you're using that guard on those guarders, you never want to let up that guard. Um, so guarders really, really make strong use of hard noggin prismatic solidity. Very, very game-breakingly powerful to me, at least. Um, reposters, they stop counterattacking when they're... Um, uh, when they are stunned. And the two reposters in the game are Highwayman and... Uh, man at arms. Man at arms, I don't think is a good uh, reposter. So I think the only real person that should really, I mean, but we're, we're lucky in hard knocking anyway on man at arms. It, it just benefits him anyway, uh, uh, like because he's a reposter as well. But the only the only other person I would lock this on considering is uh, uh, Highway Man because it 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 allows him to keep counterattacking and keep garnering a lot of value out of um, Duelist Advance. And which is really funny because um, the the starting highwayman actually comes with hard noggin and <laughs> quick reflexes, so you can actually see that the starting highwayman Dismas is amazing. It's actually he's actually quirked really really powerfully, um, and that's a that's really good. I love that highwayman a lot. Uh, yeah, but anyway, uh, let, let's get back to this. Um, yeah, but also just in general, just for all your characters, not getting to make your move is very very annoying. Um, it, it loses some action economy, just like how stuns are very strong when the player uses it against the enemy. It's the other way around is also very true as well. Uh, steady is down here as a negative 10% stress. Uh, this quirk, I, I'm actually a little um, split on. I actually think it's maybe too high. The number is actually really low. Um, it's not very 
high of a number compared to something like Photomania, which is already kind of just like just good enough. Uh, ten is really low. Ten would really only save you like one or two, one stress most of the time, maybe two sometimes. Um, but I, I think it's okay. I think I'd be willing to put it in A. I still lock it on a lot of people, but um, definitely uh, it has the same idea of. Uh, uh, these are the people who don't really do too well with it, and these are the people who do the well, the the best with it. But on top of that, um, when when you're talking about one or two uh, stress saves only, uh, at most, uh, just think about like someone who kills or crits. Uh, they heal like three to four stress when they kill or crit, and sure, there's some percentage chance of that happening, uh, of the of the stress heal occurring. But when you when you can kind of um get around what steady does with a uh, get. Uh, with just like a critting or killing uh, characters, which are which are tend to be doing anyway, it, it's kind of I think a weak quirk. It, it's not too powerful, but it, I still say it makes it into A, and that's pretty good. Uh, unyielding. This is probably the most controversial of my list. Uh, when I was uh, talking to the people in Discord about it, they really didn't like unyielding. Um, but I, I maintained I, I maintained it here in the bottom of A tier. Uh, originally, they had convinced me to move it into B tier, but I, I I just moved it back up. I just think it's too it's it's really strong for what it does. Um, and what it does is it gives you plus ten death blow resist, which sounds really really lame. Um, death blow resist is, as a stat uh, when you trinket is very very bad. Don't trinket for death blow resist. It's it's way too niche. You never want to be on death's door doing the death blow roll. So why why do we want to have this quirk that only works? Uh, when we're on death floor and doing the death floor roll, uh, I think I think it's we want to have this quirk because that's just the worst thing in the game. Doing a death floor roll and just having to pray that your character doesn't die is like the worst feeling in this game. And when that character does die, it's really bad because then you're kind of in the middle of a dungeon with three characters only when the game was kind of designed for you to be using four characters. So the enemies are pretty strong. Uh, they take like you've lost an action every single turn now, so you you feel like it's snowballing out of control. Um, just not good to be losing characters. Also, just losing characters is just bad. Just because you, you've invested so much gold and maybe like time in, into raising them uh, with the resolve exp and stuff, uh, and so it's just and maybe you you've spent gold to lock in their quirks. So just losing that character is any character at all is very very punishing in not only gold time and um and the current performance of your team, but also just bad because in Stygian and Blood Moon you have a death count that you want to preserve. Um, and generally you don't lose character, you don't lose, like, you don't actually lose the game by, by going to that death count, but it's just something you can keep in mind, and unyielding is something that really prevents that from happening, uh, those bad things from happening, and so, I think unyielding is just a good quirk to lock on everyone. Uh, specifically the flagellant, I think, is the best to have unyielding, just because he actually starts with a higher base, uh, death blow resist than most people, so, uh, if you increase it even further, it's still not guaranteed, obviously, and it, you can never guarantee surviving a death blow roll because it caps at 87. It's never guaranteed, but it's something, and I, I appreciate, uh, the flagellant being as consistently able to survive death blow rolls as possible. Even if they sometimes die on the first roll and I get mad, um, I understand what happened there. Uh, it was a, it was a light, it was a dice roll, and I shouldn't have been doing the dice roll. Right. So, all in all, those are the S and A tier quirks. I don't know how long I talked for, but we'll see in editing and see if I want to cut things. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the S and A tier quirks. Um, uh, I'll again. There's a link in the description of my of this video uh, where you can see this spreadsheet. Um, I'm still not done with it, uh, but we'll get to there. And in my next video, we'll be talking about the B and C tier quirks and why they are in B or C tier, um, perhaps. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, until next time.